We have reason to boast this morning. We have reason to boast. We boast in the cross of Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I can just sense his presence, and I know that he has touched us this morning. Aren't you glad that you can come to a church where he can touch you this morning? Praise the Lord. With like-minded, like faith, and like judgment people. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you would, this morning turns to Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. I know I've ministered on this before, but I know some of you weren't here to hear it, but the Lord, again, put this on my heart this morning for us. Lexi, I think sometimes we forget the benefits of what Jesus has done for us. And I actually have one of these on our homeschool wall because sometimes we tend to forget. Here, Alden. We tend to forget just how much he's done for us. And just, I believe it was Jeremiah, just like Jeremiah said, he says, this I recall to my mind, meaning he forgot it and he recalled it to his mind. And he said, therefore I have hope. So this morning I'm hoping to recall this to your mind, praise the Lord, in my mind. Praise God. Colossians 2. 19 through 15. When you have it, you can either say amen or stand. Colossians 2, 9 through 15. Praise the Lord. And it reads, For in him that is Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Notice it says all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Praise the Lord. Pastor Bradley, would you pray this morning? Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Praise the Lord. I give you this paper here to help you as I go along here so that you can see the benefits. And this is by no means a completed benefits of the cross. The entirety of the Bible has promises from beginning to end, which are ours. All the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yea and amen. So this is the benefits. This is the shebang, I think. <laughs> this is, this is what, what happened at the cross. And this is what you and I, we have to have a hold of. We've got to get a hold of this because if we don't understand this, Satan can come in and he can lie to us and he can try to keep us in bondage to things and he can try to hold us in, in places that we don't, where God is wanting that Holy Spirit to fight in us and we're not, re- we're not giving that up because we're being lied to. So I want us to understand this morning just how important these benefits are. 
And that's what I hope to do in this teaching, to explain why Pastor Bradley, over the next few weeks and um, maybe even months, whatever, God has given him a vision of ministering sanctification um, in, uh, the false te- in about false teachers, because it's so important for us to understand that. And we need to understand that. There's a lot of churches who preach Jesus for salvation, but there's very few churches that preach the cross. Actually, anymore, there's very few churches that preach him for salvation but you see it more so but you do not see very many churches preaching the cross for sanctification and that's one great thing there is very few churches who are going to teach you what I'm going to teach you or what Pastor Bradley's been teaching on Thursday nights what we have been trying to accomplish in whole of this ministry that's what we're bringing forth to Deschler, Ohio is the message of the cross for sanctification and if you don't understand the benefits of the cross what happened there you may understand that Jesus died for you and that he loved you that much that he went to that cross and he died for you and if you would repent of your sins and ask him into your heart that you would be saved and you would be saved you would be justified you do not have to have this knowledge to be saved understand but in order to be sanctified and holy and 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 to fight this warfare this fight of faith that we've got we've got to understand where we're fighting from because if we don't understand where we're fighting from it's going to be a hard road for us it's going to be a fight of just battling against sin of willpower flesh law all together So this morning it's important, that's why I want to tell us this, because Christ sent us not, he sent us not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. The effect is the more abundant life, it's the victory. Now I don't want people to get, and I do this too, where we hit trials in our lives and we think, is this really the more abundant life? That's not what the Lord is talking about. It's not what the Holy Spirit is talking about. Victory and more abundant life is not a life without trials. It's not a life without circumstance. It's not even a life without failures and jumping and and falling to the flesh at times. That's not what more abundant life is. More abundant life is having Christ, having the same message that saved us, indwelling in us, resting in that, knowing that whatever it is that we face, all we have to do is rest rest. That's it. There, we're only called to rest and let the Holy Spirit fight in us. Because if you and I start trying to fight this battle, we're not going to make it. Colossians 2.9 says, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In order for us to understand the cross, we must understand the sacrifice. In order for us to understand this fullness of the Godhead bodily, we have to understand that Jesus Christ was not just merely a man, but he was God. 100% God and 100% man. So the fullness of the Godhead was in him. It dwelled in him because he was God. Turn to 1 John, or I'm sorry, John chapter 1, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to show you this. John 1, verse 1. And it reads, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So what we have to understand here is, when Jesus was born of Mary, it wasn't the, Jesus It wasn't the first time that Jesus came around, okay? You have to understand, that wasn't the first time that Jesus, he existed even before that with the Father. He was the Word, and he became flesh. So he always was God. So we we have to understand that in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, not just part of him, understand, all of God. Redemption. This is the only way that we have to understand redemption too. Redemption is the only way that man could be redeemed because man was guilty. You and I were guilty 
And the Bible, t- and we were guilty of, of the broken law and disobedience to God. We were guilty of sin. And the only way that man could be redeemed was by God sending a redeemer into the world that was made without the sin nature, that, that could be made flesh, born of a, born of a woman. Hallelujah. Because the, the reason why he had to do this is because the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And although there was the sacrifices in the Old Testament where they would sacrifice the Lamb of God, that couldn't take away our sin. That could only cover our sin. And and the Bible tells us that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. So there had to be a sacrifice. There had to be a redeemer that was sent to the world in order to redeem us. And he was sent in the fullness of God. And understand, when Jesus was born, he was not born with a sin nature like you and I. Our, um, we were born with a sin nature because of Adam and Eve. Jesus was not born of that seed. He, Jesus was born of the seed of God. And he was born with a human nature and a divine nature. But you and I were born with a human nature, a sin nature, and a divine nature. But what, ha- what we need, this redemption plan that God the Father came up with, was that he would send man born of a woman, but not of the seed of a woman, but he would be born in, in, um, of the Holy Ghost. And when he was born, he would be born without that sin nature. Thereby, he could be perfect and clean and spotless the sacrifice that was needed because we knew that the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it, but we needed the blood of a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus, so he was sent as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, also bringing the sin nature, um, also bringing that sin nature into dormancy, if we'll let him. So we have to understand, Jesus is the Son of God, but not only that, he is God. He ever was, even before he became flesh. He was the lamb slain before the very, I think Peter says that. He is the lamb slain before the very foundations of the world. So he was already slain in the mind of God, even before the foundations of the world. Let's move on to Colossians 2.10. Right now I'm just laying the groundwork for the benefits. We'll actually be getting into the benefits once we lay the foundation and understand that every benefit that we receive has to come in, in, um, from the cross. And we have to understand what it means that all fullness is in him. Colossians 2.10. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all, which is the head of all principality and power. Hallelujah. We're going to learn a little bit about what it means to be complete in him. John 17, 21 reads, That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. This scripture speaks of Christ's union with the Father, furthering the fact, furthering the fact that he is God. As you read this verse, you will read a similar statement as the one in Colossians, complete in him. That the statement is that they, may, they also may be one in us. So God the Fa- Jesus speaking to God the Father, he was saying that, that you and I would become one in them. This is speaking of our union with Christ. Let's read on. There's another instance in 1 John 5.20. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God, the eternal life. Now, this is not the only time in the word where the Holy Spirit uses the words in him or in Christ. It all means the same thing. It, again, is referring to our identification with him on Calvary's cross. In the mind of God, when he died, we were literally inside of him. And I use the analogy of a bubble with the kids in kids' church. It's like we're in a bubble. We were in him, and Christ is that bubble. We were in him. We were put on that cross in him. We were brought down and buried with him by baptism into his death it all happened there we were buried with him and then we've been resurrected with him in the minds of God that's our identification 
We have to know that. We have to understand that in order to walk this out. Because the Bible says, as you have received him, how did we receive him? By, by um, express, confessing our sins and, and expressing uh, what our fault and accepting him into our heart and life. That's the same way we walk. We identify with what he's done at the cross. So we have to, we have to understand that identification and substitution that we are in him. He was our substitute man, paying the sin debt, and we identify that with that. So he was our substitute. He came and paid the wages of sin because you and I, we couldn't pay him because we weren't perfect, because of that sin nature that was in us. Praise the Lord. That is our identification and substitution. That is the only way we can receive the grace of God, the function of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And he only works this way. The Bible says he works through grace, through faith. And that's the only way that the Holy Spirit works. Do we all understand what it truly means to be in him? It's important for you kids to know that too and understand what it means to be in him. Everything we need is found in him at Calvary. So we must understand that this truth must be submitted to daily. That's why the Bible tells us to take up our cross daily and follow him. We're identifying with our substitute by faith. For we walk by faith. We know that he is God. He has already fulfilled the task. Everything we need is found in him. The Bible reads in 2 Peter, it reads, According to his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. It doesn't say some things. It doesn't say a few things. It says all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Whereby, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. You understand, we lack nothing in him. Nothing. Now that I've laid the foundation for how to receive the benefits for what Christ has done, I, now we're going to start going over what Christ has done, these benefits of the cross, which you and I receive upon faith, and, 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 we're not, and that's not limited to this person and that person. No, it, we receive this the moment we are saved. Benefit number one, a person is born again as a result of faith in the cross. This is the one, for one benefit that most people understand, that most people know. God recognizes faith in his son, which causes a spiritual circumcision to take place. I know Pastor Bradley talked about that to a little bit a couple weeks ago about a spiritual circumcision taking place. The spiritual circumcision is the work of the Holy Spirit and occurs only through faith in God's Son, which is the sacrifice. It is the only faith that God recognizes and that the Holy Spirit will work in. It is a circumcision of the heart. The new convert receives the new heart through the new birth. Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. So understand there had to be a new birth that took place. And because Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit, there could be now a new birth that could take place because of what he's done at the cross. Because he was born without a sin nature and he went to the cross as our sacrifice and died for us. So now this new circumcision could take place upon proper faith in him. Let's turn to 1441 uh, in your expositors if you have an expositors. If not, it's Ezekiel 3626. Ezekiel 3626. And we're going to read 27 too. And it reads, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgments and do them. 
So now that this new heart has been given, this is the circumcision that Ezekiel is talking about. He's talking about when Jesus would come, when Jesus would give us this new heart. This is the moral code in the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit now being placed inside of the believer, causing them to keep God's laws and walk in them, not by struggling to do so, but by being caused to do so. Meaning that it happens without us even having to think about it because we have been given a new heart. Romans 2, 28 through 29 says, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is the outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, the circumcision that is of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is of God, of, not of men, but of God. Praise the Lord. This is the circumcision that is of the heart and of the spirit. And that's what is being talked about here in Colossians 11, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Um, Jesus did this without hands. He gave his life so that our hearts now could be circumcised and his Holy Spirit could come in and take up residency and he could give us new heart, new desires, a renewed mind. Praise the Lord. That's one benefit. 11b. Colossians 11b, I'm sorry. Oh, two. I got this messed up. All right. It is, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's benefit number two. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by circumcision of Christ. My faith in the cross brings me freedom from the dominion of the sin nature. Let's turn to Romans 6, 6 and 7. <coughs> Romans 6, 6 and 7. So that we can see how that faith in the cross brings us freedom from the dominion of the sin nature. And just so everybody knows, Brother Larson had done these benefits in the evangelist last year. And I actually wrote them down because I thought it was excellent. So I'm actually deriving some of this from um, Brother Larson's um, evangelist teaching. Just in case some of that sounded familiar for you. So our faith in the cross brings us freedom from the power of the dominion of the sin nature. And we are at Romans 6, 6, 7. And it reads, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of the sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve the sin. For he that is dead is freed from the sin. Sin here should have had the definite article the in front of it, which means it, it actually does in the original Greek have the word the in front of it, which means it's speaking specifically of the sin nature. Jesus never had a sin nature, so when we are in him, the sin nature has no control over us. No matter what Satan tells you, no matter what tries to come against you, he, it has no power over you, no control whatsoever, because Christ didn't have a sin nature. It's to remain dormant. That's the idea. <clears throat> While we will all at some time or other fall to the flesh, the sin nature is not supposed to be having control in our life. We're not supposed to be being controlled by our, the evil, the old man, the evil desires, that one who was crucified, that one who was buried. We're not supposed to be being con completely controlled by that <clears throat> because now we've been made, had that circumcision in the heart that's been made without hands and we've been given that new heart, the new desires. But understand, that does not mean that at times we will not fail. That does not mean at times we will not falter. And there is a difference between the flesh and the sin nature, which Pastor Bradley does an excellent job explaining that. Maybe one of these times he can do that for us. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Sin here should have, like I said, it should have the definite article, the. If we would read, most people, when they would read this, they would think that that's talking about like acts of sin, but um, it really isn't. It's talking specifically about the sin nature. Before Christ, every single one of us was ruled entirely by that old man. We were ruled by the sin nature. But now, since we've been planted with that new heart, with new desires, and with a new divine nature, 
that's how we receive that divine nature. We, we had the sin nature, the sin nature becomes dormant, and we had a human nature. Upon conversion, we now have that new divine nature. And that's the working of the Holy Spirit in us. And that's all because we've been baptized into Christ, into his death. Colossians 2, 12a. Buried with him in baptism. Benefit number three. My baptism into Christ makes me one with him. I am in Christ. Hallelujah. I am in Christ. We must understand that our being baptized into Christ means that we are one with him. We are in union with him. We are co-buried. Think of a marriage, one that is in good relationship, activated by and through faith. He does not divorce us, but at the point that the Holy Spirit, but if we um, shift our faith off of the cross, the Bible speaks of that as spiritual adultery. So if we think of a marriage, one that's activated by faith, and we take our eyes off of the cross, Jesus does not divorce us. He does not divorce us. We are still in union with Christ. It's just that our relationship is then grieved. And the Holy Spirit then is frustrated and he can't do that work in us like he wants to do. Praise the Lord. We must understand that union with him. We must understand that how we were literally buried with him. Who we once were, our old heart, our old desires, everything has been left in that tomb. And it's supposed to stay in that tomb. So if the old man is coming out of the tomb, that's because we're bringing him out of the tomb. He's meant to stay in the tomb. Praise the Lord. 12b, wherein also you are risen with Christ through the faith, see that, the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Benefit number four, co-raised with him and in him by faith, we haven't been raised separately. Praise the Lord. We were buried with him. We are also raised with him. That's what it means to be co-raised. Praise. This is good news this morning. Praise the Lord. The devil is fighting it every inch of the way, but I'm telling you what, this is good news this morning. This is the newness of life that one receives by identifying, identifying with him in his death. That's what the resurrection life is all about. That's what the resurrection is all about. Pastor Bradley just did a, a teaching about what is it, the cross or the resurrection. And he taught how the resurrection is the newness of life. We can't get any of that without the cross, right? But what we have to understand, it's a benefit, that's a benefit of the cross. When we've been buried in with him, we've also been raised with him. We can now go to him and, and freely and receive that more abundant life. Everything that we have need of now. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right there you have it. By faith of the Son of God. You can have resurrection life when you're planted with him because you're co-raised with him as well. Praise the Lord. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If you have an expositor, it's 2038. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Praise you, Lord. And some of these scriptures I'm reading and some of them I'm going to have you turn. That way you guys can see this. And it reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation or creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now understand, that doesn't mean some things have become new. That means the whole you is new. You haven't been rehabilitated. You're not... Uh, 
they haven't just, he, God hasn't just fixed a few things. No, literally, he came in with the circumcision made without hands. He cut your heart out and he put a new one in. And then that new one included the divine nature, praise the Lord. And when he took out that old one, he also took out the effects of that sin nature, okay? And while there's still some roots in there, if you understand it, there's some veins there where that sin nature can start coming back a little bit if we allow it to, if we take our faith off of where it needs to be. But thank God, he's given us his Holy Spirit to come in and convict us and to appoint us into all truth. So he points us back to the cross and he says no 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 no. put your faith in me rest in that I've already finished the work why are you worrying about it why are you fretting over it because you can't do this thing and every time you try look what happens but I'm here to tell you Jesus did it praise the Lord thank you Jesus 13a and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. See, we were dead in sins, and our flesh was uncircumcised. He hath, hath he quickened together with him. Benefit number five. This is one of the greatest benefits <laughs> to me. Benefit number five. They're all great. Co-quickened or energized by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is the one who does all the doing in the life and the heart of the believer here on earth. The energizing and the quickening power is made to all through faith. Praise the Lord. Not only have we been co-buried, co-raised, but now we have the potential of being co-quickened. Now understand that. We have the potential of being co-quickened. That means when we're growing weary, he says, come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What is that rest? That's with stammering lips in another tongue while I speak unto my people. And this is the rest wherewith I may cause the weary to rest. Hallelujah. That's the quickening power of the Holy Ghost. When we're down to nothing, and he comes in, and he quickens us, and he empowers us, he points us back to that cross and it's like oh yeah that oh yeah moment is the quickening power of the Holy Ghost that's the same oh yeah moment that Jeremiah had when he said this I recall to my mind therefore I have hope hallelujah Ephesians 2 4 through 5 reads but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. You get that? Even when we were dead in sins, he loved us. He, hath he quickened us together with Christ. Hallelujah. For by grace ye are saved. This means the Holy Spirit is now our power source. We don't got to do this ourselves. Praise the Lord. Our power source before was our self. We were self-driven. Sometimes people might have been purpose-driven. We might have been willpower-driven. But now we are to be spirit-driven. He wants to empower us and quicken us. We can't do this thing without the quickening power of the Holy Ghost. I don't know how churches that don't preach about the Holy Ghost and don't let people speak in tongues in their church will ever make it because we need the Holy Ghost. I tell you what, if we ever stop preaching on the Holy Ghost, don't ever come back to this church again and tell every single person you know not to. But I'm going to tell you what, we're not going to quit preaching about the Holy Ghost. We're not going to quit preaching about the cross because this church is here to stay, hallelujah, because we've been planted on the foundation of the rock. And the Bible says that when the winds come, and they're going to come, and they have come, and when the winds blow, that, that we're not going to fall. But those churches that are built on the sand, it says when the wind comes, and the wind blows, and the rains come, and the floods come it says the fall of that house was great but you can be assured this morning that they've got it now they can hear it by tv they can hear it by media now there's been a lighthouse placed in this town so that these dead churches that are around here that don't preach about the cross no more let me tell you there's a few in these churches around here that love the lord there's a few in these churches that want to see this power and
and they're waiting every day upon every day sitting in that pew just waiting. Let me tell you, their day is a coming. Their day is a coming. You keep praying for them, church, and they're going to come in. Let me tell you, religion's not going to take this town, but Jesus Christ is going to take this town. Praise the Lord. I'm getting a little off subject there, but praise the Lord. <laughs> Romans 8, 11 reads, <clears throat> But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Holy Spirit that dwells in you. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit, he works in us, changing our desires. Where our desires have been changed positionally, they have not been changed conditionally. There is still a work to do in us. This is the job of the Holy Spirit, and it's called sanctification. Praise the Lord. And that's what many of you sitting in those churches have never even heard about, is sanctification. You just think that, I'm sorry, but I can't get off of this. You just think that just being a good person is going to get you through, but it's not going to get you through. You need to understand that Jesus wants to mold you into his image, and being a good person is not exactly what Jesus has in mind. He wants to take out that old heart, and he wants to put a heart of flesh in you. He wants to do the circumcision made without hands. He wants to quicken you by his Holy Spirit. He wants to lead you into all truth, because right now you're just sitting idle. You haven't grown. Maybe you're dry, and you're feeling Feeling just a little bit weary but just like I said before Jesus said come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and it says and you shall find rest unto your soul that's what you need this morning you need to find that rest that quickening power of the Holy Ghost praise God thank you Jesus the quickening power of the Holy Spirit it energizes the believer. It gives them power not to yield to temptation, but the power and the power to stand persecution. Praise the Lord. Understand that this morning. The quickening power of the Holy Spirit energizes the believer and gives them the power not to yield to temptation and the power to stand in the face of adversity, in the face of persecution. Praise the Lord. He sent him back to us for a reason church. He sent them back to us to be a comforter, to be a counselor, to be an advocate. And that means lawyer. We need all of this. So when the remains of the old man are brought to the surface from the, the, in the heart of an individual, the Holy Spirit empowers that believer to lay it aside, submit to God, and this is the co-quickening power of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. We need this power. We need this constant quickening power, this Holy Spirit constantly reminding us and pointing us back to the cross. I don't know about you, but there are just times when the enemy comes in like a flood, and we forget about all these benefits. We forget what Jesus has done for us. Praise the Lord. But let me remind you, it says, while the enemy may come in like a flood, the Spirit of God will raise up a standard against him. And he did. That standard is the cross. Praise the Lord. 13b, having forgiven you all trespasses. Benefit number six. Faith in Christ and the cross provides me with the forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future. Praise the Lord. That's good news. Faith in Christ and the cross provides me with forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future future. John 1 29 says, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The sin nature, as well as our acts of sin, past, present, and future. 
He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So don't let anybody ever tell you he just took away your sins from the past, but you still, you know, you, you're still not forgiven of your sins in the future. That's not true. But I will tell you this, that the Bible does tell us that if we sin, that we should confess our sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have to understand to keep that relationship like a marriage if I were to do Bradley wrong I need to go to Bradley and make things right or else our relationship is going to be hindered while he may end up on the couch or I may end up on the couch and if we continue this we may end up splitting up I may end up walking away stubborn and hard of hearted okay so Jesus wants us to confess our sins but understand justification we have been forgiven all sins past present and future Praise the Lord. Number 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Faith in Christ in the cross provides me freedom from the law as a means of righteousness. Praise the Lord. I don't have to sit there and try to do, 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 do. All I got to do is believe that he's already done it. When Christ went to the cross, it says he, he, he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances, meaning that broken law, because we, every single one of us has broken the law. None of us could keep that law. If, if we could, there was no point in him sending a redeemer to the world. And it says he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That means it was nailed to the cross when Christ was up there. We were in him. But notice it doesn't say that those things were resurrected with him. No, because at that it says it was nailed to the cross. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Romans 3.21 says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, law is any rule or regimen that a believer tries to live by in order to gain any righteousness, salvation, or sanctification, okay? This also does refer to the law of Moses, understand? Because if we try to just live by the law of Moses to gain righteousness with God, today I cannot steal or else I'm not saved. Or, and, and this comes in slyly. Because when we do fall and we do falter and we see that in, in God's law or in the word that it is wrong, Satan likes to come in and say, well, you can't be saved because you did that. Or you can't be saved if you're doing that. That's law. And law will always try to work in us. The Bible says that the spirit and the flesh, because he likes to use our flesh. The flesh gravitates towards law every time. And the Bible says that the flesh and the spirit are at enmity with each other. They're constantly warring, just like we read in the Expositor's Word for Every Day this morning. And Amalek came again. And in the Bible, we see it again. And Amalek came again. And it says that he warred with the children of Israel forever, continually. It's a continual war in us that the flesh constantly wants to say, do this or you're not saved. Do that or you can't be saved. Uh, sanctified. If you don't do this, then you, if you don't read your Bible every five, uh, every day for five minutes a day, then you're not going to get sanctified. No, that's not true. That's law. Our Christian disciplines position us in a place where we can hear from God. That's what Christian disciplines do. You want to hear, you wonder, you know, at times we wonder, why ain't I hearing from God? Why well, just, I just am not s- sensing his direction. His word is his direction. Prayer is seeking God. We have got to pray. We have got to seek his word to hear from God, to hear direction from him. Understand. And that is not law. So we have to define that. So we are saved by faith alone. We are sanctified by faith alone. Just as I said before, as you have received Christ Jesus, so ye walk in him. Praise the Lord. Now, remember how I told you that that benefit number one, that moral code is now placed in the individual with that circumcision, 
Remember, the new hearts. So moral code, which is the, what is ensconced in the Ten Commandments. That's what the Ten Commandments is ensconced. That's moral code. That's what God demands. Okay? And he doesn't demand anything short of that. Okay? But you and I, we couldn't do it. Okay, so that's why we had to have a new heart with a divine nature that would bring that sin nature into dormancy. That's why we need Christ. And that's why we need the quickening power of the Holy Ghost. We need Christ because in him we're a perfect law keeper. Understand? Outside of him, and I don't go inside, outside, inside, outside as my faith goes in and out. It doesn't work that way. That's justification. As our faith is in him, and we're in him, we are perfect law keepers in the mind of God. Praise the Lord. <coughs> you and I, we, we cannot gain righteousness by the law. We can only gain righteousness by faith in Christ. We cannot gain it by following the law of Moses or the laws devised by man. It's easy to say, okay, well, you know, I know that I can't just get up every morning and say, I'm not going to steal today. I can't steal today because if I steal today, then I'm, I'm not a Christian and I, I can't be saved. That's law. But it's hard to see the law, the, the, the self the willpower, the things that we think we can just do it on our own because there's different definitions of law, but it all means the same thing, is the opposite of grace, and it leads to death. Now, a problem with most believers, and maybe you're listening, but I feel led to read this. The problem with most believers is that they say, well, what about the law of Moses? And I just I explained that a little bit here. We are no longer under the law of Moses. You are, we are under the moral code of the law, understand. We are not held on a guilty verdict because we cannot keep it, because we are keeping it, you understand? Right, because we are in Christ Jesus. Jesus. And the Bible tells us if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And I, and I had said the law now, that moral code, what the Ten Commandments was, was birthed from, is now in our hearts. We don't want to do the things we used to do. There's that convicting power of the Holy Ghost now that says, don't go there. No, don't do that. Don't dress like that. Don't say that. No, you should not do that. And he brings that word up to us. <clears throat> and that, that's what the law is. It was a schoolmaster to bring us to something. To bring us to Christ. It tells us what is wrong. He will not lead us to break God's law. So if we're being led by the Spirit, it, it, by that Holy Spirit leading us to Christ, we're not going to break God's laws. We're going to be following after the Spirit of God. Galatians 5, 16 through 18. It says, This I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Understand. It does not mean God's law is bad. It is just, it is holy, and it is good. It was, like I said, ensconced out of more, that is what moral code is completely is. And that has been written on our hearts. And in God, it, it is God's standard of righteousness. We are, we are to recognize God's law and understand that we cannot keep it. You can't keep it. I can't keep it. The only person that can keep it is Christ. We can't keep this thing in our own strengths and abilities. But we must understand the Holy Spirit is now warring in us, working in us to fulfill that law. And he's in charge of it. Let him be in charge of it. And he keeps it in us without us even having to think about it. We should not have to worry about whether we're going to get up and do break God's laws today. We're going to say, Lord, my faith is in you. I have been uh, crucified with you, and I have been buried with you, and I have been raised with you, and your Holy Spirit is now functioning within my heart and life, and I'm going to walk in faith. And if I fail, I'm just going to get back up again. And I'm going to say, Lord, I know you died for me, and you forgive given me all sins, past, present, and future. I'm sorry for the way that I acted. Please help me do this thing. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 15a. 
and having spoiled principalities and powers. Actually, I feel the Holy Spirit leading me on this one. Okay, in the ta- I want to go back to the law a minute. In the tabernacle, um, when, when Pastor Bradley did a teaching, we learned that in the Ark of the Covenant, there was the Aaron's rod that budded, help me out, the, the heavenly manna, and then there was God's broken law in there, okay? And when God would come, when, when they would sacrifice that animal on the brazen altar, that perfect lamb, they would have to take that blood from that altar, and they would have to go in there, and they would wipe that blood upon the Ark of the Covenant, so that when God the Father would come in, they wouldn't, he wouldn't see that broken law, you understand? He would see the blood, so that's what it is today. When Jesus, when God the Father looks at you, he does not see your fault. Understand? He sees the blood. That does not mean that you and I are not at fault if we do wrong. But I'm telling you how God the Father sees it. He loves you. There is nothing that you could do other than quit believing in him and walk away that's going to take you out of this thing. Nothing. That's how much he loved you. He loved you even before the lamb was slain, Jesus Christ. He loved you. It says, while you were yet sinners, Christ died. He gave himself... And it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Praise the Lord. So I want you to understand that. When you have the blood applied, you do not, he, he does not see that. He doesn't see the broken law. That was the whole purpose of that. Praise the Lord. In 15a, in having spoiled principalities and powers. Benefit 8, faith in Christ and the cross provides me with freedom from the power of Satan. Our simple faith grants to us the very life and power of Christ. His death on Calvary guarantees the believer that he does not have to faith, does not guarantee, I'm sorry, let me get a drink. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to rush. His death on Calvary guarantees the believer does not have to pay, face the powers of darkness in his own strength. That's good news. 1 John 3, 8 says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's 1 John 3, 8 for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Not some of the works of the devil. He destroyed the devil. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 2.14 says, For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him who had, power of, had the power of death, that is, the devil. So don't think that the devil has any power over you. He doesn't unless God allows him. Jesus Christ destroyed the power of the devil. The word of God says it. We either believe it or we don't believe it. Do we believe that he destroyed the works of the devil? I believe he did. I believe he destroyed the power of the devil too. Praise God. That's a good benefit. That is, that, that's an awesome benefit. Praise the Lord. Jesus was tempted in all ways, such as we are, but yet without sin. His perfect, sinless sacrifice on the cross provides us victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. Hallelujah. That does not mean you will not face the powers of darkness or temptation, because God makes trials fit just for us to, try, to see how we're going to get through, but he does it to test our faith, praise the Lord, it means that now, what it does mean is that now, you and I, we're equipped to face it. You and I, we are equipped to face it. Praise God. 15b, and he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Benefit number nine. Faith in Christ in the cross places me forever in the victory celebration of Christ's finished work. All of this gives us calls to triumph. 
Praise the Lord. In the mind of God, we are actually seated in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Praise the Lord. So really, we're up there in heaven, seated with Christ Jesus, not beside him, but in him. And as he is up there, he's doing that victory dance. And he's saying, I defeated you, I defeated you, I defeated you. He's marching around and he's dancing. Hallelujah. And Brother Larson, he calls it the victory parade. And we're, we are in him. So we're doing that victory parade too. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. The word overcame here means to conquer, to prevail, to triumph. Satan's already defeated. And just as Brother Larson says, he says, I do not have to triumph. You and I, we don't have to triumph. Christ already triumphed. All we have to do is walk in that triumph, praise the Lord. And that is grace through faith. Praise the Lord. All these benefits, they are made available to you and I by the cross. All because of what Jesus has done at the cross, you and I have every benefit. And I'm going to read them real quick. A person is born again as a result of faith in the cross. Faith in the cross brings me freedom from the dominion of the sin nature. My baptism into Christ makes me one with him. I am in Christ. Co-raised with him and in him by faith, not raised separately. Co-quickened or energized by the Spirit of God. Faith in Christ in the cross provides me forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future. Faith in Christ in the cross provides freedom from law as a means of righteousness. And benefits 8 and 9. Faith in Christ in the cross provides me freedom from the power of Satan and places me forever in the victory celebration of Christ's finished work. Praise the Lord. That's good news this morning. Aren't you thankful for the cross? There's way more than just learning that Jesus died on the cross for us because he loves us. It goes deeper than that. It says that the Spirit wants to show us the deep things of God. Yay, the deep things of God. Praise the Lord. Uh, Pastor Bradley, what, you want to come now? I'll trade you. What do you got to give? <laughs> 